Hey, welcome to Live from Dennis's House. Today we have another great special treat. We have the great Stanley Clark who's going to be calling in, or we're going to be calling him. And Stanley is the greatest place bass player of all time. He's a composer, songwriter, musician, producer, band leader, you name it, he does it. And he brought the bass to the forefront and made it the spotlight instrument. He influenced every bass player to come after him, and he played with everyone. Jeff Beck, uh, Return to Forever, George Duke, Keith Richards, you name it. And now he's doing film and TV uh, composing, and he's a living legend. He's won every award imaginable for the bass and beyond. And uh, Stanley's currently on tour. He's going to be at the Highline Ballroom, New York City, September 21st. You don't want to miss that. It's going to be an amazing show. I will be there. And this is the 40th anniversary of the Jazz Fusion Masterpieces. You have Return to Forever's Romantic Warrior and Stanley Clark's School Days. Both came out in 76, and they were just the most important and influential Jazz Fusion albums of all time. So without further ado, let's talk to Stanley. But before we do that, we're going to play his song, School Days, and we're going to come right back and talk to Stanley Clark. So on the phone with us now is the great Stanley Clark. So Stanley, I want to talk about something that I found very interesting, and we'll circle back, do a little retrospective all the way up through your career till what you're doing today and, of course, your tour that you're doing. But um, great. I just saw that you are participating in the opening of the new Smithsonian National Museum of African History and Culture in Washington, yeah. D.C. So mm-hmm. that sounds like a great honor. Tell us what's going on with that. Well, that's, uh, it's actually like a, uh, it's, it's a museum, a part of the Smithsonian uh, Institute that just deals with the history of the the whole Af- Af- the African-American scene going back to slavery uh, to now, and it's, you know, it, it, it kind of has all the, has a lot of, like, really, um, you know, important documents, it has some things, uh, all sorts of stuff. And then the other thing that's really nice is the music is there from that point to now. Oh, okay. So you have, you have everything from, you know, Parliament Funkadelic's Mothership, Oh, All man. the way back to, I think, Robert Johnson's guitar Get out. Um, has my electric bass in there. Oh. It's like a regular museum where they have, like, Lena Horne's clothes, this person's that. It's, it's a pretty, like, somebody could walk in there from another planet and go, well, who are these people they call African-Americans? What the <laughs> hell happened here? Okay, you know, Africa, so now they're here. What happened? And you go in there and you get the whole thing. It's it's a great narrative, uh, you know, using you know physical objects and uh, a lot of writing, a lot of documents in there. So it's a very it's big too. It's a it's a huge huge thing. It has a, an amazing theater in it that you can perform. It, uh, it's a really tremendous structure, you know. So I'm really excited. Wow, that sounds exciting! Very Carter. awesome. Are you going yeah, to be performing, cool. too? Yeah, well, I'm going to give, like, a little clinic, like a bass clinic down there, uh, some down there to do that, and I'm sure they'll have my bass in a corner somewhere, so I'm going to see my little section down there, you know. So, <laughs> should be fun. Should be fun. Oh, that's going to be awesome. Is the president going to yeah. be there, too? Yeah, he's going to show up, uh, you know, and he comes in, and he comes out. The security is so heavy. By that, so he goes in and he goes out. Um, so you were born in Philly and you studied the acoustic bass. Now, yeah. uh, during this time, it was like the '60s, though. Um, were you uh, strictly a jazz guy, or did you like any pop and rock at that time? Well, yeah, I was. Um, I'm known as a jazz bass player, but to be quite honest, I started out studying classical music on the acoustic bass. I was gonna. I was attempting to become a, a classical bass player playing an orchestra. Right. And at the same time, like most kids in, in my time, you know, we were also Motown. James Jameson on the bass was a big influence. Um, and, you know, rock and roll was emerging, you know, Jimi Hendrix and... You know, it's pretty much, I'm not sure there's any real, 
be 100% jazz musician. I, I, I think from the more, the older I get, you know, and even some of the older guys, the really old, see, see back in the 30s and the 40s, jazz was the pop music, you know, and so, right. you know, and as you get older, you know, a lot, a lot of the guys from my generation, you know, all were sort of, you know, multi-genre listening types, you know, but what happens is, you know, when you're put you know, out on the market, you know, and you're the jazz bassist or you're the jazz saxophonist, I mean, you know, you're, you're out there. I remember one time uh, uh, Wynton Marcellus' brother, was uh, Branford, was telling me, you know, I was saying, man, you guys get so heavy in there like you're jazz musicians. And <laughs> Branford is always more open, in, in my opinion, funny, just funnier. And so is, so is Wynton, too. But <laughs> Branford said, oh, man, we used to listen to Earth, Wind, Fire, too, man. You know, <laughs> I used to listen to this. I mean, you know, it's the Sly, you know, it's Sly Stone. I mean, you know, so it's, 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 uh, I listened to everything. If, there, if it was okay. on the radio and I had access to it on a record, I listened to it. But jazz for me was a study because out of all that music, I could play the Motown stuff. I could play a lot of the rock and roll stuff. And I, and I, I did that, you know, playing gigs and all that stuff. But the jazz stuff, which is a little more complex musically, you know, you'd get those records and you'd sit down and try to play that stuff or go to a teacher who might know what it is and you know, try to figure it out that way. That That's why I think it has a, a certain distinctive, unique importance to, you know, so-called jazz musicians. So, and definitely in my case, it was just something that I, I just couldn't listen to it and say, oh, okay, now I'm going to go play that. You know? Right, right, yeah. It was impossible. <laughs> so now, to uh, to get to your level of playing, how much time did you put in as a kid? You, you know, because I heard, like, um, someone, uh, I think it was Charlie uh, Parker, he pl- practiced 12 hours a day, seven days a week for, like, three years straight to get to his level. Did you put in that kind of time, or? Yeah, I was, I was a pretty intense guy when it came to practicing. I used to practice, you know, every day, Sundays, Saturday, every day. I, mean, I, I put in for a couple of years when I was younger, I'd say, you know, a good five hours a day. Wow. Solid, solid practicing. And, and because I had a, you know, like, like when you're a musician, your practicing hours and your habits and your time is totally determined by what your goals are. You know, right. you're trying to sound like this guy, or you're trying to sound like you know beyond Jimi Hendrix, beyond John Coltrane. You want to? I want to play better than Miles Davis. I mean, you're going to have to put some practice in, and and then also playing, like playing with other people, because that's the that's a fifty percent of it is not just sitting there playing scales all day. You have to right, go right. and actually play with someone. And put a lot of time doing that rehearsing and all that stuff. And what about what about up till today? Do you still play every day, or I don't, I don't definitely don't practice as much as I used to. But I'm a better student today. Like I I can pinpoint what I don't know. So if I need to know something that I don't know, I can get right to it, and I have an understanding of how to get it. So um, that, I'm good with that. But, I, you know, when you get older, you have a lot of uh, information and a lot of, as they say, money in the bank. You know, <laughs> you have all this stuff that's there to draw from. And so when you get older, um, you know, if you need something, something you can't do, you got to sit down and, uh, and and practice. And it's, uh, I mean, you can never know everything because, it, again, it depends on, what you're trying to do. I mean, right, right. there's always something. You can always be somewhere and have an idea, particularly if you're a composer like myself. Right. You can write something. I've written things that I can't play. So <laughs> I have to write something and then actually sit down and figure out how to play it, you know. So, you know, and that Chick Corea happens to him all the time, you know. It's, you know, composing is, is really, you can make that completely separate from you as a player, almost like it's another person. And you can write all this stuff that you couldn't play to save your life. 
<laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. So now that you brought up the composing, I'd like to talk about that, and we'll circle back again. But um, you are now involved in music and TV composing, and I understand Pee Wee Herman uh, was responsible for this, and getting you into this in a kind of a way. Yeah, yeah. I've done probably seventy feature films and television movies so far, and the first thing I ever did wasn't a TV movie, but Pee Wee's Herman's, Pee Wee Herman's, I think it was called Pee Wee Pee Wee's Playhouse. Right, right. And um, it was a guy called me I on a, a show with Barry Mendel. He, he was doing a TV special, a jazz TV special, and he was singing. He wanted a lot of jazz musicians in it, so I was there. And then the director, the guy that directed Pee Wee's Playhouse, and he said, hey, have you ever done music for television? And I said, nah, I never really thought of it. The movies, I said, nah, I never really thought of that. I said, you know, I like the James Bond movies. You know, that music kind of sticks out and all that, you know. So he, he sent me some footage, and it was a show about childbirth. They were trying to teach kids in a very benign way about childbirth, and they wanted some weird music, but not too weird. So he thought <laughs> I could do that. And I did it, and then I got this Emmy nomination. I really wasn't even aware of what Emmys were at that time. And so I just did that and then kind of never looked back from that wow. point on. Just kept going. And you, so now, so now you're uh, you're living out in L.A. doing all this with the movies. So you're kind of uh, you know like a Hollywood celebrity yourself. Do you get to go to these fancy parties and things while you're out there? Yeah. Or? No, you know I'm never. I was never into the fancy parties. I was into the <laughs> crazy parties. <laughs> they don't, those parties don't exist anymore. Thank God, you know. But uh, yeah, I, I kind of yeah. I I I live in a, a mountain town called Topanga. Okay. Uh, near near Malibu, and I live up in the hills there. So I hardly ever go into the city anymore. Right into okay. the heart of uh, Hollywood and all that stuff. But I'm I'm sure they got parties there now. But it's, it's a different <laughs> Proud, man. Like, you know, so yeah. now you you mentioned about these crazy parties back in the day. You were involved with the New Barbarians and Keith Richards back in 1979. So how did yeah. that come about? And was that a crazy time, or what was that tour like? Yeah, it was crazy at a minimum. <laughs> 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 that tour, that was that was a quite an experience. Uh, you know, they called me. They, you know, there was something happened to Keith and. In uh, Canada, I forget. Yeah, um, drug arrest, drug yeah. And so he had to do like a makeup concert or something. Right. Or he'd go to jail. So he had the concert. And the problem with those guys, they can't just gear up for one show. <laughs> it's so expensive for them to do just one show. So they have to do like, I don't know, 10 shows and maybe the first four pays for them. Or one, and then somehow it was worked out like that. So we did a bunch of shows, and it was actually a lot of fun because I got to know those guys um, um, different than what people think. You know? Yeah, like I, one of my good experiences was I, I talked a long time to Mick Jagger one night about music, and I was amazed how much he knew about all kinds of music. He knew my records. He was telling me different tracks on my record. He, one of his favorite musicians was the jazz musician, Sonny Rollins. Okay. Player. I mean, that was one time they called me to ask Wynton Marcellus to play on my records. You know, it was a, you know, these guys, uh, although they play what they do, but, you know, like most musicians that are defined by a genre usually do not, just listen to that music. <clears throat> You'd be amazed, like what certain people listen to. But those guys, they listen to everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've always found that that makes the best musicians people who are well rounded and like appreciate all kinds of music and love everything. Yeah. Now, is there um, any kind of music you wish you played, or is there actually anybody who you wish you could have had the opportunity to play with who you never have yet? I never played with Rabbi Shankar. Ah. I always wanted to play with him. I met him. I'm well, funny. I met him in um, Mumbai in India. Ah. And I was playing 
with a real famous uh, Indian violinist named um, El Subramanian. Um, Rama Shankar was at the side of the stage, and and it was an amazing gig. I had all these drummers. These guys are playing in a twenty-one-seven. All these time signatures. Yeah, I was in heaven, man. <laughs> Uh, so now, now let's go back to the beginning for just a little bit here. Now, um, you graduated in 1971 from the Philadelphia Music Academy. You moved to New York, and it seems like you were embraced right away by the old guard, like Stan Getz, Dave Brubeck, uh, you know, Miles Davis. So, like, how did you get in with these guys? Like, how did they bring you in? You know, I don't know. You know I think sometimes I think about that, like, you know, these guys, did they like me? Did they like my plane? What was it? Because it, it did seem like I just kind of walked in the door and everything was kind of easy. But, and I, I realized I was really prepared when I came to New York. I could I could read music pretty well. I was a pretty decent person. I was young, so I wasn't jaded. I was just kind of very open to for anything. And I think that that's like important, you know, like if you have those two qualities as a musician, I tell some of the young students I have, you know, like if you're really, really prepared musically and you're a nice person and you're flexible, you're open for anything, you know, chances are you're going to be welcomed pretty easily. So, you know, that must have been like the most exciting time, too, when Chick Corea, when you're doing Return to Forever, you know, the uh, Romantic Warrior, your solo albums. And it was a a great time because it was it was something new. You know, we were spearheading a new thing. It was, you know, they called it jazz rock music or jazz rock fusion. Right. And it was just really nice because it was something new. and. I really can't explain what it's like to be a part of something that's groundbreaking, you know. Yeah. It's really, really exciting. You always have people talking about it. There are always people coming out, looking and gawking at us and just wondering, what are like, these guys playing? What is this stuff? <laughs> and and uh, it was really something. And we've made a lot of friends with other groups like, you know, rock bands and things. I saw, like, you know, there were a lot of bands that, you know, we play on their shows and we were just as loud as the rock bands. Yeah, absolutely. Our music was as powerful. It's just that we had different information. It's funny, I saw this keyboard player that used to play with Yes named Patrick Moraz. I hadn't seen him in a long time. And I saw him recently. You know, I, I met Jeff Beck. I remember I put out my first solo record. I was living in Long Island. It's funny, I haven't told too many people this story, but... I was sitting in the house with my wife one afternoon, and this long limousine pulled up. So I knocked on the door, and it was Jeff. I never met Jeff from, from nothing. He walks in with that kind of rooster haircut, <laughs> and, he, and he said, I got your album. And he said, I'm playing this tune off of your album called Power. And he came in, and you know, we talked for a little bit, and then he goes, uh, Great, I got to go play. So hope we can play one day. And that was that. It <laughs> turned out that that my lawyer was knew his lawyer, and there was some, and gave him my address. And Jeff kind of Jeff just showed up, and I, I loved it. Yeah, <laughs> I always always liked it about him. He just didn't call, just showed up. Oh, that's knock, awesome. Knock, knock, who's there? <laughs> oh, that's great stuff. <laughs> now, now, one thing that you did that I really loved, too, was the Clock Duke Project um, mm-hmm. back in 81. And I have that album right here. I'm holding it in my hands. I saw you guys on that tour that year. And, you know, there was just so much good stuff on there. I loved your version of Louie Louie and, uh, the, you know, Wild Dog and, uh, you know, Sweet yeah. Baby was beautiful, you know. And, like, yeah. Did you get any like, did you get any flack from people who were saying that it was like you know, like jazz purists saying that you know that's like pop music you shouldn't be doing that or anything? You know, we you know, we probably did, but I had to really be honest with you, man. I never really listened or cared about it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I used to like if I'd see those guys if they do interviews with us. I used to really do my hardest to to, to seem like I was interested and involved. When I tell you, man, 
I didn't care, especially George didn't care. You know, we, you know, it's when you're young, there's a certain feeling of being invincible that you have, and and the type of guys that we were, we didn't, we knew, we knew that we could play our instruments. No one could ever say that we couldn't technically play our instruments. Yeah, absolutely. I remember people used to write and say, "Why is he doing that?" You know, or "Why are they doing that?" You know, but no one could say, you know. He's a terrible bass player. <laughs> not played a piano. <laughs> so when you're young and you know that you're doing something and you have all your basics on your instrument, what you decide to do with it is what you decide to do with it. And it should never be what someone else thinks. It just, Absolutely. You know, cause if, if, cause it was, cause if that was the case, you'd never have Jimi Hendrix. You'd never have Miles Davis. You'd never have... Uh, John Coltrane, you never have Janis Joplin. You never have so many artists. Yeah. You know, it's the thing that bothers me about the music business today. I just wonder would those artists exist? Would you could you have another? Will another Prince come along? Will another, you know, Return to Forever come along? Will another George Duke come in? Because the business is, is different now. It's yeah, not, it sure is. Not like it was in the old days. Yeah, yeah. Well, we can hope and pray someone comes along, but I don't know. It's not looking good. <laughs> yeah, we hope so. Yeah. We hope so. <laughs> so now you're gonna you're out on tour now. I'm gonna be seeing you in New York City, September twenty first, Highline Ballroom. And Oh yeah. You're gonna be doing Europe as well. So uh-huh. uh you seem to do Europe a lot. Like what's your favorite place? You love going to Europe? Where where do you love to play? You know, I love even though lately it's been kind of dangerous playing there, but I love to play um, in France. They have these; they have a lot of music festivals there in the summer, and you can go to a small town, and the whole town will come out to hear you. And the food is just unbelievable. <laughs> There's just, you know, I love it there. I love I love playing there. Um, you know, because of the tourist stuff. There's there's a few places you know you don't go anymore to like. Tunisia, you definitely don't go there. Now, Turkey, I used to love to go to play oh, no. in Istanbul. But every time I went there, I could feel I'm a little heavier, a little heavier. You can feel it in the air, you know. And then this last thing that happened, you know, it was just kind of... Yeah. yeah. You know, that's, but there's a lot a of places to play on the planet. I just came yeah. back from China. From China. Wow. They have the most beautiful jazz club in the world in Beijing that they just built. And now they're just figuring out how to partner up with the government so they can promote it on a larger scale because, you know, everything is pretty much controlled by the government. Yeah. Because, you know, it's a real communist country there. Yeah. You definitely know that. <laughs> so now, so, um, so what, um, what can we expect to hear? Actually, let me ask you, do you know that this is the 40th anniversary of Romantic Warrior and School Days? You know what, man? I just realized that. <laughs> you no, know, so I'm going to play School Days, and I'm going to hope that we can play something from, we just have to rehearse it, um, play something from the uh, Romantic Warrior album. That oh, really cool. Because I know, I know, Demi Old's been out there. A bit. Yeah, I just saw him a couple of weeks ago. He was doing his two uh, 40th anniversaries too, so uh, worked wow. out good. Yeah, man, it's time is flying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So now, of of all the awards that you've won, you've won every base award there is, and many other different awards. What award were you most honored with getting? You know, my favorite award. I have. To, I never thought I would actually say that, but. It's for a couple of reasons. Like I got this award at the Montreal Jazz Festival. I believe only twenty four people have it. And it's called the Miles Davis Award. Oh. It's a really prestigious award where the whole festival is in honor of you. So you play like, I don't know, five or six shows with different types of configurations and all through the you know, the the festival. And it's, that award is absolutely the heaviest award physically I've ever had. So I remember getting the award. The guy handed it to me. I said, man, this is heavy. The guy said, so I said you can't believe it. There's no way I'm going to take this on the plane. <laughs> I mean, it's as heavy as a bag. You know? <laughs> uh, the extra, the overweight just for this award. You know? uh, so, 
<laughs> but it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful ward, you know. There's a lot of um, really, you know, I'm just happy to be in that company. It's yeah. called the Miles Davis Award. It's beautiful, and, and the sculpture is just, it's heavy as shit, but it's, it's, it's beautiful. <laughs> That's beautiful. awesome. So now I'm predicting an Oscar in your future as well for these uh, scores. Yeah. If, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm looking for it. You know, I, I, I became a, a member of the Academy some time ago they voted me in and then recently as of a couple of weeks ago they invited me to become one of the executives in the whole oscar thing so you know we vote for the oscars so that's kind oh, of nice. fun. Mm -hmm. excellent and, um, excellent so now i'm giving you the award for the best bass player to ever live so congratulations on <laughs> that too all right and all right, my friend. And I want to thank you for the music you have given me. You've personally given me a lot of joy, and I want to thank you for that. You are an amazing musician and a wonderful guy. Very nice guy, too. So, uh, right, well, thanks. It was nice talking to you. Yes. So we'll see you out on the road. Go check out. you have anything else that you want to talk about that's coming out soon? You got new music yeah, out or anything? Come, people should come out to the High Line. I, I think... Um, I think people are going to be, it's a really exciting show. It's going to be really, really kicking. I think people are going to really enjoy it. So yeah. It's going to be fun. Can't wait to hear it. All right, man. All right. Thank you, Stanley. We'll see you All September right. 21st at the High Line. Stanley Clark. All right, man. Thank you. Cool. Bye. Take care, man. Hey, welcome back to Live from Dennis's House. That was the great Stanley Clark. It was a one to talk, a great, wonderful treat to talk to him. He's a wonderful guy, and of course, a great, great musician. And as he said, he's going to be performing September 21st at the Highline Ballroom. Go check out all of his music. It's the 40th anniversary of School Days and uh, Romantic Warrior and all this stuff. It's going to be a great, great show. If you've never seen him before, it's ridiculous how one man can play the bass that fast and that melodic at the same time. So, uh, you know, we learned a lot about uh, Stanley Clock, everything there is to know. And, uh, you know, that's it. We're going to wrap this up now. We're going to play a little music before we go. So let's wrap this up. We're going to play Majestic Dance by uh, Return to Forever. And then we're going to have some live music with Jeff Beck and Stanley Clock jamming together. So that is that. See you next week on 474. This was Live from Dennis's House with Stanley Clark.